It is Howard Hughes. It is Sunday night, becoming Monday morning here at Talk Radio. One of the nice things that we do after midnight on Saturdays is we meet characters from a variety of fields, as they used to say. People who've had a bit of a life on them. And the man that we're about to speak with definitely fits into that category. He is one of the people uh, in a category that I admire most. They are the people that I call and have called through my career as a radio busker and sometimes a news bulletin uh, <laughs> preparer and reader. He's a proper journalist, uh, a proper Fleet Street veteran. His name is Colin McKenzie, and he's uh, been good enough to write his life story, uh, which is called Pressing My Luck, uh, which is a beautiful pun and works very well. He's online to us now. Uh, Colin, thank you very much for doing this tonight. Very nice to be on your show. Now, Colin, you you say in your book, which I've been reading today, and you can always tell a good book, Colin, I think, when the pages are tightly packed with words. I start to worry when the pages are loosely packed with words because it means the author has not got much to say. In your case, you've got a lot to say. But you say in the book that one of the people you most wanted to meet, and you've met everybody, was Howard Hughes. And you <laughs> never got to meet him, but the good news is that you're being interviewed by Howard Hughes now. <laughs> so, it's absolutely brilliant, yes. <laughs> you know, he so, was one of the great stories that I failed to get in the 1970s. There was a lot of mystery about whether he was still alive. He was the world's most professional hermit, and uh, there was a lot of speculation as to whether he was dead or alive, and that was one of the reasons he features in the book is one of my failures. Did you get that? I mean, look, this is uh, for those younger listeners who may not remember Howard Hughes. He was an eccentric American multi-billionaire. He is the man who created a plane called the Spruce Goose. Actually, it had a, a, a better name than that. But uh, the Spruce Goose was the, the press nickname for the plane. It was huge. And he said that if this thing does not fly, I will disappear from America and never be seen again. He kind of fulfilled that by becoming a recluse. But he was much more than just a man who hid away. Uh, naked in a Las Vegas hotel suite. He was a genius in many ways. He invented a bra for a movie actress at uh, RKO Radio Pictures, which he owned. Uh, he was an engineering genius. He was a lot of things Howard Hughes. But in his later years, he was famous for decades for being a recluse. And everybody, including you, Colin, wanted to find him, yeah? That was true. Uh, it was a, He was an extraordinary person. I mean, I remember that aircraft you talk about. I think it was the world's largest ever aircraft and there was a lot of speculation about whether it would ever uh, uh, take off in, in fact it did take off but it was too large for its own good and uh, most airports couldn't take it and, and it died a natural death um, but he was uh, not only a recluse but he wouldn't allow his fingernails to be cut or his hair to be cut he was absolutely paranoid about health and i think he lived in a sort of his own bubble to coin a modern phrase uh, at the top of a las vegas hotel the last 20 odd years of his life. God knows what he'd do today with COVID. <laughs> exactly. I think he'd be a melted. I think he'd have been panic stricken. How near did you get to him? He had a famous assistant whose first name I think was Walter. Um, I can't remember his second name, but he, he had an assistant who looked after his business affairs for many years. Yes, he did. And I can't remember his name. Now, to be quite honest, uh, the reason I mentioned him in my book was because there were two or three great stories at the time to be had. One was finding Ronnie Biggs, which I did manage, and one was finding Howard Hughes, which I didn't. And I can't say I spent an enormous amount of time, but the Fleet Street in general was chasing the Howard Hughes story. That was the point I was making, really. And then, of course, he went and died, we believe. <laughs> but, then, but then there goes another story, because there are people um, who say that he didn't. Um, and that also goes for Lord Lucan, who you also, I know, have stories about. But we'll get to that. Talk to me about right. you, then, and the genesis of your career as a journalist. Because like the best things, certainly like my own career, and I was taught by Fleet Street journalists, so I kind of know how all of this worked in the glory days of Fleet Street. Um, you know, you, you don't get in there by sending in letters of application necessarily necessarily, do you? Well, uh, oddly enough, in my case, I, I probably did. I, <laughs> when I came down from Oxford, I, I wrote off to 15 different provincial newspapers, including the Oxford Mail, uh, asking for a, to join them as a trainee hack. Uh, and I got either ignored or turned down by all of them. So as a last resort, I wrote off to the Mail and the Express. And to my utter astonishment, was offered an interview on both. And um, in those, I'm talking about 1964. In those days, uh, a lot of local papers wanted kids 
straight out of sixth form. They didn't really want university graduates. It's all turned on its head now. But in those days, uh, they, they wanted kids straight out of school. So uh, I applied to the Express and the Mail, and to my astonishment, got a job offer on both. And uh, I joined the Express because in 1964, it was selling 4 million copies a day. It was the major middle market paper, a broadsheet, uh, and it had hundreds and hundreds of reporters and photographers. Lord Beaverbrook, the owner, believed in a huge staff, and it was the right place to go to be taught how to be a journalist. And I literally learned on the job, really. I don't think those days we will ever see again because of because of the demands of the market competition and the fact that you can do so much with so many you know, with so few people these days but i do remember uh, when i first started in radio in london i came down to work at independent radio news which was just off fleet street in a place called gough square in fact you know yes, the, re- the reporters well the reporters from lbc as you will know used to drink in the cheshire cheese uh, so that <laughs> that's where all the all the radio people and the print paper people People came together and the traditions then were ingrained I, I arrived in London as the 80s were becoming the 90s and things were changing you know things were being economized upon but on the news desk that I worked I, I read the news and wrote the news but we had a bulletin editor um, a person over him or her in the middle who was in charge of it all and then at the end of the desk we had a throwback from Fleet Street a copy taster a man called Mike Church, whose job was solely, he was a lovely man, he used to speak like, he used to say, Howard Hughes, you're a tof, sir. He said, uh, I've got this piece, this uh, story, uh, Howard, it's just come in from Reuters, you might want to see this. His job was to, as you will know, Colin, was to check, like they did yeah. in the newspapers, to check the wires to see if any stories had broken, which you could see yourself anyway by then, because he had computer screens. But he would come and alert yeah. you to the fact that Reuters was reporting an earth tremor in San Diego. <laughs> yes, well, th- those are wonderful characters. We used to have men, old men called messengers, and they, uh, I'm going back to the 60s and 70s now, prior to computers, and they would bring a story down, and they had done it for so many years that they could judge a story as well as any trained journalist. And we, had, we had a lovely old boy called Laurie, and uh, he was a war veteran, and he used to come down and say, good story here, Colin, you get your teeth into that. And, and, and he'd be right, 99 times out of 100, you know, he, he could really judge a story. And, of course, you're talking about joining uh, LBC in the mm. late 80s and 90s. It's 89, the end of 89, the Daily Mail moved offices from Carmelite Street out to High Street, Kensington. And, of course, the Murdoch papers went to, um, uh, to Canary Wharf. And, unfortunately, that was the exact era when Fleet Street as such ceased to exist. Mm. And I think uh, newspapers have lost a hell of a lot by not being in a community village of of hacks. I I think they have, absolutely. I used to, my very first night doing a night shift in London, I'd never taken a car into central London before or (laughs) anywhere very much. I parked my VW Beetle outside the offices of the Daily Mail who were in the process of moving uh, to where they they are are now. Um, so, but but it was, and there were rows of newspaper and the steam rising from the pavement, and it was a remarkable thing. But it's it's an era that's gone, and I think sadly. So there you are. I think you get into the Daily Express, don't you? But you don't get into. I do at the start of my career. But but you your career takes a turn. The story best told by you. Well, I had ten years on the Express, uh, man and boy, um, and I mean, for example, uh, one of the earliest stories I did, I was sent onto the. Hickey, William Hickey column, which had 12 reporters on it in those days and would produce two columns, one for the uh, first editions and then a late edition, London orientated, um, going to parties and all that sort of thing. It was an ex- extraordinary experience. But uh, just to give you an example, one of the very, very first stories I was asked to do was to find famous old Etonians and to explain what their first day at school was like. Uh, and this was a September. So the first um, days of their uh, experiences at Eton. And I thought, well, I'll ring old Harold Macmillan. He'd just stopped being <laughs> prime minister. He'd gone back to his old job as chairman of Macmillan's publishing. And I thought, well, you know, there's no more, more famous than him as an old Etonian at that time. And I literally rang through and I thought, well, there'll be bound to be secretaries and people in the way. Then I got straight through to the chairman's office and there he was, the old boy, answering the phone to me. And uh, he wasn't that keen to sort of say what had happened on his first day. And he actually said the most immortal words, Mr. McKenzie, as a publisher, you will appreciate 
my reminiscence is a copyright. And I thought, that's a wonderful quote. <laughs> In other words, he wasn't willing to tell me anything, but the quote itself was brilliant. You know, <laughs> you couldn't do that these days. All, all the old ex-prime ministers are surrounded by PR men, by secretaries, by everybody else. Uh, th those were the days where you could actually get through to somebody. I mean, literally a week later, as I recount in the book, I rang up Field Marshal Lord Montgomery, and Monty, the great hero of the Second World War, because I uh, somebody had rung in and told us uh, that, that he was trying to do the treble chance, which was the football pools. Now, people today won't understand what it was, but in the good old days of Littlewood's pools in the 60s, you tried to pick out eight draws from the four divisions of, um, of, of league football. And if you picked out eight draws, you'd probably win 70 or 80,000 pounds. It was a, a brilliant thing to do and quite rare. And dear old Monty couldn't work out how to fill in his form. So he rang the chairman of Littlewoods, uh, Mr. Moores, up in uh, Liverpool. He said, Moores, Montgomery, huh? I'd like you to send your best lieutenant down to Hampshire and teach me how to do the treble chance. Uh, it was the most wonderful story. And I'd been alerted by my colleagues that uh, Monty would always answer the phone, but he would uh, only stand one question. So I had to put all the details of, of the, how this poor chap found his way to his mill house in Hampshire, uh, explain the old rigmarole of filling in the treble child. I, the whole question I asked started about 10 minutes. And Monty said at the end of it, he said, great, great. He had a sort of Jonathan Ross type uh, affliction with his R's. Right, right, and put the phone down. But because uh, I put every detail into the question, I was able to repeat everything in the paper. You, you know, and it was, one, one shot at the question. One um, shot at the. <laughs> did, did, do we know if, if Monty, the hero of World War II, actually kept playing the the treble chance? Well, I think he did it for the next few years. I'm, I, there's no evidence he ever won it, but uh, he, he kept him going. I think you know. When you get to a certain age as I am now, you like every little distraction to keep the days going. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can understand that, but there's a certain incongruity about the man who beat Hitler, uh, you know, chancing his luck on the pools. But good on him is, is what I say. OK, so yeah. there you are on the Daily Express, and you are, you know, finding yourself in a situation where you're able to contact people and get their stories. And sometimes, like you say, those things are happenstance. You've got a, I don't know whether this ties in with this era, but you've got a story in your book about Miss World, the Miss World competition. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, well, I, I was assigned to cover the Miss World competition. Uh, I mean, at that time, I was relatively, well, I was. I was young, not bad looking. They thought I could get my, my way around some of these Miss World contestants and find out who was going to win and get all the gossip. And, and we have to caveat this today, I, saying that this is a previous era. Uh, we know that the Miss World competition <laughs> is not put on television these days, but in a previous era, when we were less enlightened than we are today, uh, the Miss World contest was a regular fixture on mainstream television. Sorry. Not only that, but in 1967, which was the year I was asked to do it, um, Ladbrokes in, in, introduced betting into the whole thing. And I think there were something like 80 or 85 contestants, uh, and uh, they were offering sort of odds of 10 to 1 the field, which was ludicrous, really, because how on earth can you possibly find out? But uh, there were quite a few punters on the hickey column at the time, and they all said to me, um, well, find out who's going to win this thing, we'll all back her. Uh, and, and if you don't find out and you get it wrong, your job's you're fired. I thought, bloody hell, that put a bit of pressure on me. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I, I decided that Miss Peru was absolutely stunning. And I suggested that we all invested. I think she was 16 to 1 at the time. And we duly did. And I think I collected five quid from about 25 members of staff and went down and had a ludicrously large bet on Miss Peru. And the betting shop under the um, Express at the time was Joe Coral and the Mar the, the, the manager of the shop thought, well, another mug punter coming along. So he just took the bet. Anyway, long story short, Miss um, Peru started being sort of backed, and we wrote a couple of stories about her. And uh, one of my colleagues on another paper said, you're mad, you know. She can't speak a word of English. She'll never win. So that started making me panic a bit. Anyway, on the very night of the uh, competition, um, she got down to the last eight, and at least that was something. And uh, and then Mr. Eric Morley uh, d did his usual number of uh, saying who had uh, come third, who had come second, and the winner is. Well, the third person was Miss Guyana, 
um, who went on to become Mrs. Michael Caine. That's Shakira. Yes. Uh, the second uh, girl was Miss Argentina, uh, whose name I've forgotten now. Uh, and uh, I thought, oh, well, they can't have a clean sweep, South America. But to my utter relief and, and amazement, uh, Miss Peru was uh, nominated the winner. And your and job survived. <laughs> my job survived. We, were, we all marched into Joe Coral the next morning and he was, he was shouting, Stewards Inquiry! I said, There's no Stewards Inquiry, they're all weighed in. Stewards Thank Inquiry, you pay the and money. Had, and I was, of course, for, for about 10 minutes, I was the hero of the office. And of course, you had a, a great story so, as well, which is you know the, <laughs> almost secondary in this case, but was certainly part of that. And we have to say, uh, just again for the benefit of our listener, that of course these are more enlightened times and we don't have beauty contests per se of that kind. We live in a different era now, but that's a nice story <laughs> from, from what is now, um, in, in all of our lives, a, a bygone era. Uh, more from Colin McKenzie. His book is called Pressing My Luck. Uh, we'll talk about Ronnie Biggs next. Stay here at Talk Radio. Colin McKenzie is here after midnight on Talk Radio across the United Kingdom. I'm Howard Hughes. Uh, your book is packed with stories, so let's get into the one about Ronnie Biggs, which is the story. We all have one thing in our lives, I think, that probably we're proudest of, and I am guessing locating and talking to and getting to know the most notorious of the great train robbers is your story. Well, uh, it, it, it certainly was a huge uh, scoop at the time. It has, I suppose, defined my life and my career, uh, although it had lots of stresses and strains, as I reveal in the book. Um, uh, he, he was, uh, had been on the run for nearly 10 years. Uh, his presence was discovered in Australia, and his wife had been arrested and the discovery of his children uh, in 1969. But another f nearly five years had gone by, and he'd gone missing again. And uh, nobody had a clue where he was. And um, I gave a party pre-Christmas 73 for my dear late father, who lived in Brazil, oddly enough. Um, he'd been a um, cattle rancher and coffee rancher working for the Vesti Company, Frigorifico uh, Anglo, out in Brazil. And he was over on leave. And some of my neighbours um, came to a party I gave him. I was living in Battersea at the time. And one of them was a 19-year-old kid who I'd never met before, but his mother was a neighbor of ours, a Russian countess. And um, he came up and he found out that I was on the express. And he said, gosh, he said, I bumped into somebody you'd like to meet. And before he could finish the sentence, I said, Constantine, you found Ronnie Biggs in Brazil, didn't you? Oh, and he went absolutely crimson. He had, I, I mean, it was extraordinary. I, I knew I'd hit the nail on the head. And I said, um, look, Conti, we'll go out for a pint tomorrow and, uh, and we'll have a little chat about this. And uh, indeed we did. And he said, how on earth did you know? I said, the mere timbre of your voice and the fact that you knew you'd bumped into somebody interesting, I just took a chance. And he said, well, it's quite extraordinary. You should imagine I did. I bumped into him. And we became good friends last summer. And that was the summer of 73. And oddly enough, Biggs had asked him to find a journalist uh, to do his story, to give himself up. Because in the interim between getting 30 years for the train robbery uh, and his escape from prison in uh, 65 from Wandsworth Jail, uh, a new parole system had come in. And so instead of having to serve a minimum 20 of the 30 years, uh, you were now eligible for parole after one third of your sentence. He'd already done a year and a half before he escaped from Wandsworth Prison so he could confront uh, the idea of serving a further eight and a half years because he'd actually run out of ideas and he'd run out of money uh, and he wanted to get back together with his wife in Australia. So he was quite willing uh, to do this, but Conti had actually, A, forgotten that he was asked to do this, and B, didn't know any journalists until he bumped into me. Well, so it was a piece of pure, <laughs> Once more for luck, fortuitous. I mean, we have to say, of course, this man, notorious criminal involved in a horrible crime in which a man was badly injured, the driver of the train, and subsequently died. So we mustn't forget this, um, because some of the media, I think, was inclined, certainly in the 80s, 90s, to turn this man into a bit of a folk hero, which he certainly wasn't. But nevertheless, you know, he was a character, so much so that he'd almost news managed his own return to the UK because he wanted to find a journalist. He wanted to tell his story before anybody else got the chance to um, and start the ball rolling. That that shows that the guy had a mind. Oh, he wasn't uh, unintelligent. In fact, 
uh, unlike most of the train robbers, he um, he was well read uh, and also managed to learn Portuguese in uh, quite a short space of time. So he was pretty fluent in Portuguese by the time I met him, and he'd been in Brazil for four years. Well, uh, I I knew uh, expats living in Brazil, wives of fazendeiros and things, who couldn't speak a word of Portuguese. So he, he had that. Um, uh, quite native intelligence, um, but and uh, you're right. He, 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 not to make him a hero, but of course the the Great Train Robbery was romanticised by all the newspapers and everybody for many many years. Um, he wasn't a particularly violent person himself. But you know, just uh, so I, that I, our, our younger listeners understand this crime in the 1960s that they may just know the name of, you know, this is how serious it was. Ronnie Biggs uh, put behind bars but gets sprung out of jail and then goes to South America where he is found by you. Well, he obviously he went to Australia initially and he worked as a carpenter uh, between 65 and 69, uh, moving from um, Brisbane to... Adelaide, and then back to Melbourne. And, and, he, and he was rumbled, day, wasn't he, by a neighbour? He, he was rumbled in Melbourne after a, um, a magazine article appeared with his picture uh, because um, Bruce Reynolds and Charlie Wilson uh, had given themselves up, having been on the run. And so there was another rerun in all the magazines, and it was crystal clear that um, people would recognise him. So he went on the run in Australia for a couple of months, stayed with a from friends until he could get a boat out of Melbourne Harbour in February uh, 70. And that boat took him to Panama. And from there, he went down to Brazil. And he'd researched the fact that there was no extradition agreement with Brazil. So he thought he'd be fairly safe there. But he literally arrived with not a penny to, to himself and uh, uh, started out working as a carpenter for expats, doing up apartments and flats. And he'd been, obviously, had to go completely straight for four years until I found him in, in Brazil. What was the first meeting like? Well, it was, uh, I'd spoken to him on the phone a few times to arrange all this. Um, and uh, he had a quite a high-pitched voice, which I didn't expect. But he was tall, good-looking. He was about six foot one and a half. Good-looking chap of about 45 when I met him. And um, he always had a pretty girl on his arm, you know. I mean, he was uh, making hay in that regard <laughs> while he was in Rio. Uh, and um, the, the the extra pressure I had on my back, of course, was the fact that my uh, uh, editor of the Daily Express, Mr. Ian McCall, um, had, had decided to involve Scotland Yard. And this was not part of the deal that, that I'd arranged with Biggs. I'd arranged with Biggs to be with him for two weeks do his story, get all the photographs, hand him into the con British consul in uh, Rio de Janeiro from where he would be taken by plane back to London and arrested on his arrival at Heathrow. But long story short, uh, we had done a story four months prior to my big scoop about finding um, uh, a, a Nazi in in Buenos Aires, um, Martin Borman. Right. And what uh, happened was that uh, we got slightly panicked into publishing early. We had a reporter and a photographer there for six months, and they thought they'd got uh, Martin Borman on, um, in, in pictures, and they thought they'd got the story. They were slightly panicked by the fact that other papers were getting wind of the, their presence down there, and they published, in this was in September 73, the fact that we'd found Martin Borman in South America, Hitler's main Nazi ally. Well, it turned out that the person we photographed uh, was a perfectly innocent Buenos Aires school teacher. Now, that didn't help uh, matters. Not only that, but we'd said that Borman was a director of various South American companies, notably Fiat and one or two other uh, car manufacturers. And um, the whole story, in other words, was a pack of lies and, and didn't stand up at all. We got sued for the moon. The Daily Express got sued to the moon. With this in mind, when I waltz into Mr. McColl's office three or four months later and say, I think I've found Ronnie Biggs in Brazil, he started panicking. All he could see was pound signs going over the horizon into South America again. So to, to get a bit of insurance, he quite one-sidedly and without telling me, decided to uh, involve Scotland Yard. And um, long story short, just on prior to my going out to Brazil, I was frog-marched 
to the uh, flat of our in-house lawyer, Andrew Edwards, in Olympia, where I bumped, where I was uh, introduced to Detective Chief Superintendent Slipper, uh, his Sergeant Peter Jones, and a top man from Scotland Yard, and told Slipper of the Yard that I was Slipper of the Yard, and told I was going to have no more than four days before they would move in and arrest Biggs. Well, I was, as you can imagine, deeply shocked. How did you not give that away then? If you knew that was going to happen and that was going to be inevitable, um, my face would tell the story. Well, let me tell you what I planned to do. Because I knew Brazil quite well, because my father lived up country, I had decided with my photographer, Bill Lovelace, a most fantastic photographer, um, the best help any reporter could ever have, we had decided that if we had four days with Biggs, we would alert him to what was going to happen, and he could make his mind up himself whether he would uh, want uh, to go back with Slipper of the Yard or whether he'd like to go on the run again. And I had arranged um, for an, uh, basically for an escape route through the interior of Brazil. Um, Wouldn't you have well, been aiding and abetting, I mean, the legal framework well, different I, out I, there, but uh, aiding and abetting a felon? I, I would, but we didn't have an extradition arrangement right. with Brazil. No. There was no arrangement. It would be perfectly reasonable for a reporter to go out and research a story. Mm. But, but I'm, I suppose I'm law. talking morally, I suppose, not, not legally. Yes, morally, uh, I, I, I would have been doing the wrong thing. But uh, legally, probably not. Um, but I was, to be quite honest, shocked mm. and ashamed that I'd been made the victim of this conspiracy to uh, to let Biggs down. Anyway, it happened that um, on the second day, uh, we had a great deal of trouble with communications between Brazil and London. It took four hours for a phone connection to work. I mean, it's extraordinary when you think, um, we'd already landed a man on the moon and had communications. But in those days, if you made a phone call, uh, booked a phone call to London, you had to sit by the phone for four hours. Well, I knew I didn't have much time, so I went ahead, got as many locations with Biggs by the Corcovado Mountain, up the Sugarloaf, down now Avenue de Atlantica, uh, in various apartments he'd worked on. And the first day and a half was spent doing that. And I then planned to alert him on the, th- the third morning about what was about to happen in 48 hours' time. Well, the office took that out of my hands because when we had a midnight conference with them, uh, at the end of the second day I was there, I was told he was going to be arrested the following morning. Well, Biggs had gone off into the night with this beautiful leggy blonde Lucia. I had no idea where he'd gone. There were no mobile phones. He hadn't. His own phone wasn't working because he never paid the bill. But in fact, he hadn't gone to his home. He'd gone to Lucia's parents home out in the suburbs of Rio. So I had no prospect now of alerting him to the fact that he was being arrested in the morning. And in the morning, we had arranged for him to come at 10 o'clock a.m. to my hotel room in uh, Trocadero Hotel on Copacabana Beach, Um, by which time, of course, Slipper, uh, his sergeant, and a couple of uh, gun-toting Brazilian local police were already surrounding the hotel. So they watched him go in with his girlfriend up to room 909 uh, on the ninth floor of the hotel. And a quarter of an hour later, it took them a quarter of an hour to get the lifts working or something. They came in, knocked on the door. Constantine went and opened the door, thinking it was room service, and then walked Slipper of the Yard Mm -hmm. and said, hello, Ronnie, long time no see, famous uh, expression. And the the whole thing collapsed around my... Eyes and ears. So it was put your trousers on, your nicked, as they say in the Sweeney, and that was it. Did he? Did he think? He must have thought you'd shopped him. You, you, you know, floated well, him down the he, river. He did, uh, uh, more so eventually, but uh, initially he thought it was it was a cock up. And I promised to try and help him by getting him a lawyer and uh, getting as much help as I could. And then discovered that his real girlfriend, who was up in the north of Brazil, and reemerged a couple of days later, called Jaimunda, she was actually pregnant with his um, his child. Oh, no. And she was due to give birth in August. And this, extraordinarily enough, became the passport for his uh, remaining in Brazil. Yeah. Because although he had no papers and no nothing, he went up to prison in Brasilia, and the lawyer I had hired for him, Jose Pertensi, was able to argue that this child needed support and um, bringing up 
and therefore he, he was to be responsible for this. And indeed, he did bring the child up, and in fact, his girlfriend uh, disappeared in, uh, to Switzerland, Raimunda. Do you know, I'd forgotten uh, this. So ultimately, when he did come back, he came back in failing health, and he came back on his yeah. terms. He did, but this wasn't until 2001. Yeah, he was one, years out by there. By which time he'd had uh, three strokes. He couldn't even speak, uh, I'm afraid, by the end. And uh, in 2001, he came back, went to Belmarsh Prison for about seven and a half years or eight years and was released um, uh, the same day as the Libyan bomber was released from prison mm. up in Scotland. Do you remember mm. uh, Al Megahi right, right. Uh, mm. uh, was responsible allegedly for the bomb? Abdul Basset Al Megahi. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Uh, he, uh, they were released on the same day on, on grounds of. Um, that they were going to die anyway. And um, in actual fact, Biggs outlived Al McGrath. Al McGrath died of prostate cancer within about two and a half years. Biggs lived for four and a half years in a care home in North London. Mm -hmm. An astonishing story, and we haven't told the half of it, really. <laughs> Can we talk, because the radio is always frustrating, the minutes are always ticking down on you. Just quickly, about somebody I've been fascinated by and have done... Uh, many conversations about Lord Lucan. You were on the trail of Lord Lucan, the peer of the realm who was implicated in a murder at his home, the children's nanny there, Sandra Rivet, vanished from this country. People have cited him all over the world. People have said he's dead. People have said friends have been harboring him. You think you tracked him down? Well, I think I tracked down where he was. Uh, obviously, trying to follow up on the big story, I resigned from the Express. Um, taking a rather high moral line, I suppose, having been let down so badly mm. by the editor. Big mistake. I should have <laughs> got my redundancy, but there you go. Not a good idea. Uh, and literally um, within days of my resigning from the Express, uh, the nanny of the Lucan family, Sandra Rivet, was murdered uh, at, uh, at their Belgravia house. And obviously Lord Lucan... Uh, went on the run or committed suicide, and it's a moot point as to what happened. I personally always believed uh, that he was a gambler and he would have gambled on keeping himself free. And he had very rich and influential friends, as we all know, um, who were able to get him out of the country and to wherever he was. And uh, I'm fast forwarding now about five years. I had a lunch party in my house in Battersea yet again, and we had some um, friends over who were um, related uh, quite closely to two of Lucan's best friends, let me put it like that. And on that particular Sunday lunch, ITN News claimed they were going to meet uh, Lord Lucan on an island in the West Indies, and if uh, people looked in on their 6 uh, p.m. bulletin, they would find Lucan at long last. And this was being advertised in the one o'clock lunch. And I mentioned this to our guests who were mutual friends with Lucan and everything. And, and the girl started laughing her head off as if to say, well, they're, you know, they're on the wrong trail there. And I mean, I, she didn't say much, but it was crystal clear. She knew exactly um, that he was never going to be in the West Indies. And she was going along the party line that, uh, that he'd fallen on his sword. In other words, he'd committed suicide and jumped into the channel a uh, uh, couple of days after the murder. So I let that rest for a minute, uh, for a few days, and we got invited back to lunch with them about three months later. And there was a little story in the Sunday Times, no more than eight paragraphs, by Peter Hawthorne, their man in Pretoria, and it said that uh, there was uh, South African police were investigating the possibility that this clothes salesman was commuting between Botswana and Johannesburg uh, and was thought it could be Lord Lucan. And I plop, plumped the story down in front of this girl who would laughed her head off at the idea of the West Indies, and she went absolutely white. And it was rather like my moment with Constantine Benkendorf when I knew I'd hit the nail on the head with Biggs. I thought I'd hit the nail on the head with this girl, and she was very silent after that. Anyway, I took a chance. I was freelancing then, and I went down to South Africa for four weeks to try and follow this up. And let me just say, it's all in the book. I um, had quite a lot of uh, confirmatory uh, information that he was and had been in South Africa, 
uh, not least a file that the Secret Service had on Lucan in the South African uh, police departments. I went up to Lorenzo Marquez, which was a then the well, capital. M- Mozambique now. now. Yes. Uh, and that, but it was, was Lorenzo capital, Marx, wasn't it? It's now, it's now called Maputo. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I went to a bar and produced a picture of Lucan, and the barman said, yes, he comes here every three months. Uh, luckily, I still spoke reasonably good Portuguese, and uh, th- that's the man who comes and picks up money from the bank around the corner. And um, that was enough for me to sort of pursue the story. I couldn't absolutely categorically nail it at all, and I never wrote about it, uh, but I'm certain that I was on the trail, and I'm certain that if he's dead, he died in South Africa. I mean, he'd now be 82, mm. how, so he could well be dead. How astonishing. And that's the greatest story never told, which I think exactly. is is a fitting way to end this. Just one quick question. I would have liked to have talked with you more about the celebrity, sadly. That damn clock, no time. But um, Richard Burton, my <laughs> all-time hero, I know that you met him. Um, was he as charismatic as all of the interviews that I've seen indicate Yes, he was. I mean, he was <laughs> he was wonderfully freelance, if I can use that expression. Uh, I do tell the story about uh, when my um, fiancé at the time and later wife and I went up back up to Oxford and he and Liz Taylor were appearing in Dr. Faustus. <clears throat> we went to the after-theatre party at the Randolph Hotel and we sat down um, with a young, well, not so young, middle-aged couple from Wales and started chatting in my uh, fiance was from Wales, and so we got him famously. And when finally Burton and Taylor came to the party, uh, Richard made his way straight to this young couple, uh, this sort of middle-aged couple, who had been his childhood friends in Wales. So we had the benefit of him all night long. And um, Elizabeth went off from, uh, um, and, and had dinner with the the angels, the people who uh, supported the production. And then she kept coming over, stamping her heels, saying, "Richard, you've got to come and see the producers." And eventually he said, he used the F word and said, you know, I'm with my friend, you F off. And she eventually went back to their hotel in Woodstock by herself. And I then um, puffed up my uh, chest and I said, Richard, it's been so much of a thrill to um, talk to you, but I must confess I'm I'm on the Daily Express and I'm covering this event. <laughs> he said, I'd love to have a one-to-one chat with you. He said, present yourself at the Bear Hotel Woodstock, 10 o'clock tomorrow morning and I'll give you breakfast. And he was true to his word. It was brilliant. And uh, he gave me a most wonderful interview. He oh. was drinking a bottle of vodka, and I was drinking. I was eating cornflakes. Uh, <laughs> how wonderful. Um, there are a million stories, and I would love Sorry, to. Sorry, my friend's game. And I think that could be another scoop coming in, so i better go. Colin McKenzie, thank you so much. <laughs> You're a real journalist. Thank you so much, Colin. Bye-bye. Thank you. Colin McKenzie, Pressing My Luck is the book. Thanks very much to Sam, Sarah and uh, Holly for this week. Thank you to you too. The Unexplained, 10 o'clock tonight. Here at Talk Radio, I'm Howard Hughes. Good night.